Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time. In each episode of this podcast, we invite a special guest to take us on a tailored tour of the past. Travels Through Time is brought to you in partnership with History Today, Britain's best loved serious history magazine. You can read articles relating to this podcast and more about our guests at historytoday.com forward slash travels. There is also a special subscription offer for Travels Through Time listeners. Three issues for just one pound each. If you could travel back through time, where would you go? What would you like to experience? What would you like to find out? These are the kind of questions I'll be putting to guests in this new podcast for History Today magazine, Travels Through Time. My name is Peter Moore, and in each episode I'm going to invite a special guest to become a time traveller for half an hour or so. There will be rules to their travels. They will not be allowed to interfere with the history, or to participate directly in events. Instead, they are to be the silent witness, like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, the cloaked figure in the corner, peering in, watching, eavesdropping if they like, but nothing more. They will choose their historical year, and within that time, travel to three different scenes. Now we have the ideal tour guide for this first foray into the past. Michael Palin is an actor, a writer, an explorer, a fish-slapping python, and a former president of the Royal Geographical Society. He has written many books of his travels from pole to pole or across the Himalayas, and in September he released his latest work, the Sunday Times best-selling Erebus, or The Story of a Ship. A few days ago I met with Michael by the banks of the River Thames in London, deep in the basement of his publisher's Penguin Random House, in a darkened little room that was to become our very first time machine. Our destination was the 1840s, and I began by asking Michael what it was that enticed him towards this time. Uh, A ship called Erebus, really, and a love of the sea and a love of exploration and a fondness for a particular period when enormous risks were taken by very small ships and very dedicated men to chart the world, really. It was a golden age of exploration, which is largely ignored. I mean, I I read history at Oxford and I I loved history at school. I never heard anything about Erebus or Sir James Clark Ross's expedition. Um, I did know about Erebus's fate in the Arctic later, but the first extraordinary Antarctic journey is what enticed me. To, to look at the story of the ship. It might be good, actually, if you told us about Erebus. What was she like? Was she a graceful ship? Erebus was quite a chunky ship. She was designed to take mortars, uh, 10 inch and 13 inch mortars on her deck, which would lob shells at towns under siege from the sea. So it was all about dealing with the recoil from these very, very strong cannon. And so her deck would have been strengthened with diagonal timbers as well as, as horizontal. And also uh, her bows would be very strong. She wasn't a big ship. She was 104 feet long. She was about, about 350 tons. So she was chunky, by all accounts, not a graceful ship, but people were, were fond of Erebus. People on board wrote lovingly of her, of her attributes of sailing not fast, but being very solid. Someone said very solid below decks, if not when you were on deck. So, they, so they she were. rolled quite a she lot. She rolled. But she rolled well. Ships had to undergo a report when they came back, and, and at Chatham, when she returned, was a ship's report which said that she rolled well. Okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, I suppose rolling well is a subjective thing to the person who's on deck. It might not roll so well if you were getting accustomed. And of course, Erebus was not quite a loner. She was often in company with another ship as well. She was in company on her two major voyages with. Uh, Terra, which was another bomb ship like Erebus, but built slightly earlier. And Terra had seen action against the Americans in the War of 1812. Right. Uh, she'd lobbed shells in the Baltimore. So by the 1840s, Terra was a bit of a, a veteran. Terra was a bit younger, maybe. 
Ter- Terra was, uh, was a, a certainly a veteran. She'd also seen the Arctic in the 1830s. Whereas Erebus actually, once built, went for a very short journey around the Mediterranean, sort of on patrol, really, nothing more than that. And after that, spent 13 years in ordinary, as, as they say, you know, virtually sort of waiting for a job. I get the feeling that this um, meander around the Mediterranean was a nice prelude to something which came afterwards, which was a bit more stern, shall we say. Shall we go to your first scene? You have picked June the 1st, 1841. Do you want to tell us what was happening on that day? Well, yes, I'm in, I'm in Hobart in Tasmania. And in the small bay, later called Ross Cove, after the captain of Erebus, two ships were moored up very close to the bank. They had been lashed together and decorated with balloons, mirrors, lights, awnings, walkways with the palm fronds above them. And there was a big entertainment going on on board these two ships, Erebus and Terror. Erebus had been cleared for dancing and Terror for dining and a large number of the society people of Hobart were coming on board to enjoy the hospitality of the Royal Navy because the two ships wanted to thank the people of Hobart for being a haven to them as they came back. So what were they celebrating? Antarctic. What was this great ball? Should we call it the Erebus Ball? It was, yes, it was, yes, it was called the, the Erebus and Terror Ball. The Erebus and Terror, Terror, Terror was And Erebus. did invitations go out um, with that at the top of the uh, invitations? Thing? Yes, uh, invitations invitations went out. They were very keen on proper printed invitations. Okay. And the officers so there was four. and the captain. Was yes, it was, it was all properly organised. And the people of Hobart then, it was a sort of increasing, sort of swelling middle class who liked social events. Mm-hmm. But they hadn't seen anything quite like this before. In fact, one of the people who goes on board um, was an 18-year-old girl described as a lady of fashion in the papers, uh, later said that this was the greatest ball they'd ever seen in in Hobart. She danced with both the captains. And how would she get on to the... uh, Well, how would she enter the ball for the Erebus from the shore? Would she have to go across some stepping stones or something? Yes, well, you'd go to the government house, which was just about sort of 100 yards or so up the hill. You'd go there and carriages would stop there and then you'd walk down and an area had been cleared, and then there was a, a walkway out to the two ships, probably about you know, 50 or 60 yards. And this was a covered walkway, which had, had flowers and plants growing over it. And it was, quite, it was quite dark, so you went through this passage, and suddenly you came to the end, stepped on board HMS Erebus, which was the first ship you'd step on. The two captains were there. Everything was bright light, so you yeah. would go from the darkness into this sudden bright light. And they had the wonderful idea of using mirrors that they'd they brought on board to give to natives you know in, in remote islands uh, in exchange for sort of food or something like that you'd give them a few mirrors so all these mirrors something like 700 mirrors wow. had been hung up and were reflecting the light so it must have been a sparkling a sparkling occasion brilliant so um we're coming into christmas party season so this seems like the right time to be talking about the erebus yeah. ball what were they celebrating though? what were what were all these mirrors out for what were they uh, excited they, about they were celebrating the safe return of the two ships from their first antarctic expedition which had lasted about four and a half months they'd set out from hobart um, and they returned to hobart having discovered a volcano antarctic having discovered that antarctic was a continent having discovered the extraordinary ice shelf which was sort of like 200 feet high stretching for miles and miles later known as the ross ice shelf and also gone further south than any other ship had gone in history and this is a sailing ship yeah. Uh, with no power to turn around if the wind yeah. was in the wrong direction, you're stuck in the ice. They'd come back, an enormously successful expedition, and they were also relieved, so they wanted to, to thank the people of Hobart. So it sounds to me like a, a blend of fashion, almost like the old Regency fashion that we think of slightly earlier, and something of the Victorian exploration spirit, and, I don't know, just transplanted into this little bay at the far end of the world for mm. British people at mm. least who would be there and if you were if you were among the crowd mm. who would you like to watch well they made a number of friends the crew and the officers particularly in Hobart and there was a wonderful man called McCormick who was a naturalist on board or rather he was actually a surgeon on board Erebus who loved making friends. Whenever they stopped anywhere, he'd be the first to get off the ship. Usually he'd shoot a few birds because he loved <laughs> he loved wildlife. 
and uh, seems but, paradoxical. It seems paradoxical, yeah, exactly. but of course, at the time, you know, they yeah. they couldn't photograph what they saw. These were strange and weird creatures. They wouldn't yeah. see them again, probably. So the best thing is just to get their hide or their fur or their skeleton or something. Anyway, so I'd love to see McCormick there because he was, he was, um, he obviously loved company. He'd become very friendly with a family just outside Hobart. Also, I mean, I'd love to see Captain Ross. James Clark Ross was a rather sort of dashing man fine head of hair and he was called the handsomest man in the navy by lady jane franklin so i'd like to see what he was wearing and how he turned <laughs> out and then there was francis crozier was the captain of hms terror and he was rather a different sort of character rather more solid bluff northern irishman never really got the recognition he deserved he was a very good captain a very good navigator but he was always second to somebody yeah. else and I'd like to see how he would have dealt yeah. with the dancing and might, he, might have been he, second he, on the dance floor that might have been, might have been yeah. second on the dance floor <laughs> first at the bar maybe I don't know but there, it was it's nice that the two captains you know sort of shook hands with people as they came on board mm. and of course they would have um, opened the dancing because in one sense it seems quite frivolous but on another what you're saying it had quite a formal purpose it was thanking people it was to say thank you for their hospitality mm. and um I suppose it's one of these exciting things that we think of um, Hobart being a gateway town, and for them yes. it was the gateway to yes. the, the Antarctic, yes. which was unknown yeah. at this time. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I think that of all the places they visited on this long voyage, Hobart was the most congenial yeah. in terms of climate, in terms of facilities, friends, social life. I know that some of the um, the crew, a man called William Cunningham, who was a uh, Marine, left a very good diary. He was on HMS Terror, and he made very good friends with the military who were in a barracks in Hobart. And of course, being a Marine, he was with this sort of fellow, uh, fellow military men, as it were. They became very friendly. There was a play put on after they returned from the Antarctic at the local theatre, which described the, the adventures the ships had been on. Apparently it wasn't very good. James <laughs> Clark Ross didn't go and McCormick went but hid behind a curtain as okay, he watched him. Okay. So, but, but, you know, there was a lot of links with Hobart. They'd come all the way from London, which had taken them, you know, over almost a year to get to Hobart. And they'd been in, in appalling storms in the Southern Ocean. They'd been to islands that were very inhospitable, but they had to go there to, to take scientific measurements and describe the flora and fauna and all that. But Hobart, they called it our southern home. And that's how... James Clark Ross referred to it. Good. I think the one word which is echoing around my head is geniality. Well, this genial mm. reception they had. Mm. And from that, I like contrast. Let's go to your second scene. Not too far away, or maybe a long way away. I'm not sure about distances, but we've gone to the 1st of January mm. in 1842. Can you tell us where you are and what's happening? The two ships, Erebus and Terror, had set out probably a month before on their second Antarctic voyage course they went in you know our winter their summer so it was December but it was unlike their first voyage conditions were very much more difficult the ice was much thicker it was altogether much colder and on New Year's Day they found themselves absolutely stuck fast again towards the ice shelf further south than any other ships they'd ever been apart from themselves but the two ships were absolutely stuck there were no channels ahead there was no chance of any was this movement. a distressing situation or I would think so. Mm. I would think it's very distressing because they had very little mobility. They just had the sails. If there was no wind, and, mm. and there was no wind at that time, they were just stuck. But the interesting thing is that the attitude of the men on both the ships was to sort of make light of it and sort of celebrate their predicament on New Year's Day. It was going to be a new year rather than, you know, sort of feel that, that they were stuck and this was it and this was going to be the end of their their voyage and what were they going to do they had a party <laughs> and they had a wonderful party on the ice because the ice was so thick they could walk from one ship to another so it was really like being you know in a harbour or something like that you just it's get, like one get of those iconic frost fairs on the Thames or yes like that, that kind of thing yes and I think it's it's interesting how you describe it as um as an almost ironic reaction it's the this yes. is the British Navy of the 19th mm. century where they used to talk about shooting and being shot at with great good humour, you know, it's that kind yes. of the opposite reaction to as you'd expect. So yes. what was going on? What was happening? Well, I think that it seemed largely led by the crew themselves. It wasn't officer led, and although Clark Ross approved of what was going on, but 
Uh, James Hooker, who was the assistant surgeon on Erebus, and later the very famous botanist, and friend of Charles Darwin, of Hugo, friend of Charles Darwin, he went out with another sailor on board Erebus, and they they went out into the ice and they carved an eight foot woman in the <laughs> ice, which all thought was very jolly. And then they they later carved a dance floor and they carved tables and they carved an ice sofa, and generally they prepared themselves for a New Year party. This is what they were going to do. Wow. And they created um, a pub using sort of some of the masks or the spare masks, whatever they had, to put erect signs. Um, and the pub was called the Pilgrims of the Ocean. And what is interesting is that, that when the party happened on, or on New Year's Day, the idea was to make as much noise as possible. So there were a lot of trumpets and all that. They banged drums. They had pigs on board and they put the pigs under their arms and squeezed them till the pigs squealed. <laughs> Why? Why was this terrific cacophony going on in, the, in this utterly, utterly remote part of the world? Answer being, I think, because it was just reaction to the silence. Mm. And the silence down there must be totally and completely, especially if there's no wind at all. The ships are stuck, there are no creaking timbers. There's no sound of water. There's this real there. strong Gothic undertone here. Isn't yes. it? And of course, the 1840s, this yeah. is around the time yes. that we're getting the Bronte novels coming out of Yorkshire. And yes. this kind of great rise of the Gothic. Yes. And yeah. then down there, it's this, this you kind of have in your head, I think, the, the whiteness of the snow, the, the clear skies, mm. the silence. Mm. You know, mean, it, they must have been the only people on the sort of bottom yeah. tenth of the planet. I mean, huge, huge silence in this previously undiscovered area and i think that's what must have driven them to make the noise yeah. and have the party and have as much fun as possible just to say look we're here we yeah. exist we're not going to be intimidated we're not going to be frozen out yeah we are not put and off. a very we're puzzling indeed, for, the, uh, for the penguins watching on us yes, 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 yes as yes. much as uh, yeah and mr palin watching this um yeah. at the far side of the world yes. would it be a nice to be a grin on on your face as yes well. absolutely yeah I'd, I'd have i'd have joined in <laughs> I don't think that's just the most wonderful thing that you could have done in that extreme situation. Yeah, and it is. It is extraordinary. Really, you can't happen. imagine. Um, it's almost like the British mm. character in Extremis, isn't it? <laughs> and, yes. um, and the and the response <clears throat> to that is to yeah. build a pub. You know, yeah, which is quite. But also, I mean, it's also the fact that the hierarchy of the ships, which are very clear, you know, camps at the top, the uh, able seamen at the bottom, of the pub, but they all joined in. And the captain, James Clark Ross, almost literally let his hair down because he danced. They did the first dance on the ice with Crozier. And a witness said, Captain Crozier and Miss Ross opened the dancing. So Ross must have been in drag, oh, which right. actually was not anything new for him. He'd been in drag on the expedition 1831 in the Arctic. And I find a very strange um, comedic antecedent for you, uh, underpants on your head. Is this, a, is this James Clark Ross as a as a python a hundred years before? You can imagine him there <laughs> yeah, with yes, the, uh, the yeah. rouge on his cheeks, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it was music hall, definitely. <laughs> it was python. I think the whole situation yeah. was very pythonic. Really. Yeah. The idea of actually. carving a woman and creating a pub and a sofa. I think that's just lovely. So so you could sort of sit down on the ice but, and, and relax. Maybe we should send um, you all back down there to recreate this wonderful pub. Yes, that'd yes. Be, that would be great. I OK, well, John let's Hughes leave that because I think um, yeah. the cold winds are blowing through us and um, they're going to continue because we're going to go hmm. on to your third scene, which is a little bit later on. Time has passed. We've hmm. gone from... Um, the jovial early 1840s at one end of the world and it's now the 22nd of april 1848 where are we what's happening we are in the arctic almost saying the canadian arctic but there was no calendar at the time so we were in the arctic islands uh, off the coast of north america erebus and Terra had been stuck fast in the ice not just for a new year's day but it was before and a few days afterwards but for one and a half years They'd just been unable to move. And this combined with the earlier delays meant it was almost they were almost three years since they had left London to try and uh, discover a passage, a way through the Northwest Passage, which had not yet been achieved. It almost been achieved, but the last sort of 200 miles had not been covered. Things had gone wrong for them. The ships were stuck fast. And on this particular day, the decision was taken to abandon ship and try and make their way south to the North American mainland, hopefully find a Hudson's Bay post or somewhere where they could uh, uh, 
get food. So we're looking at a big group of sailors leaving yes. their ship, which is their home. So yeah. it's an incredibly emotionally yeah. powerful scene yes. for them. Well, they, they realise they're in grave danger here. Which individuals would be involved in this? Well, the leader of the expedition, Sir John Franklin, was one who would not have been involved mm. because he had died 10 months earlier on board the ship. We know all this, I know all this from one note that was discovered called the Victory Point Note, discovered in a cairn later on by people 10 years later. Franklin had died nine of the officers and 15 of the men had died in the previous 10 months so something was going wrong very fast whether there was scurvy on board ship we don't know but one feels that the people who left must have been weak and really unable to travel very far which proved to be the case so would you be interested to see who was taking the decisions and who would mm. what would your hunch be who do you think was marshalling mm. the uh, the soldiers at this point my hunch is Fitzjames, who was the second in command of Erebus, I think was probably one of the leaders. He left the note. They knew it was his handwriting on the note. So Can you tell us a little alive. bit about him? What kind of person was he? Fitzjames, quite a jovial bloke. He was 31, 32, had no Arctic experience and he was chosen to be Franklin's deputy. He, most of his experience had been out in the East as an artillery officer in the, the, the Opium Wars in China. Yeah. Um, but the men liked him, and he was a very good writer. He wrote very interesting sort of entries, diaries, letters. And he seemed to have a very good positive spirit as they left England and were about to set out. He was the one who was saying, oh, we'll get through. It's all going to be fine. So I think his optimism would probably have kept him going. The other one, I think, who was probably helping leading them was Crozier. Yeah, and he's the one that we met before, of course. He was the one at the ball. He was the one commanding terror during that New Year's Eve party, dancing with Captain Ross. Again, dogged, loyal, decent man, Not never given the sort of leadership of the expedition that some people felt he should have been given. But he probably was in the end. He would be one of the people who were leading the men south. We know that a, a lot of the what I know about this period is Inuit testimony, which of course was oral testimony, but they do describe the Inuit meeting a party of people and the leader of the party sounds very much from their description like Crozier, a sort of middle-aged man, quite stocky, quite, quite strong. And they met not long after they left the ship and they talked to the Inuit and they exchanged some food with them and that was it. There was, they couldn't speak to each other because they didn't know each other's language. And this lifeline for these people was cut at that moment. The, the Inuit went off their way. And, uh, you know, the Inuit may well have been able to say, look, come with us. We will take you here. But because they couldn't communicate, this was one of these terrible moments where probably the last hope was dashed. Mm -hmm. And after that, they died, as we know, fairly soon. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't manage to travel very far at all. Is that correct? Well, some of them did get to the North American mainland, which is about 300 miles. But they all died, and they died at a place called Starvation Cove. Most of the others died on the way south. Some of the auxiliary boats on the ship had been towed along. They found their dead bodies in them. But a lot of people think, and, and then again, Inuit testimony bears out the fact that some of them may have returned to the ships and taking command of the ships again because they were seen on board the ships in 1849, which is a year And this after is an incredible left. length of time after they've not just only left, but have gone yeah. missing. I so know. if you think how long a day or a month or a year is, that we're talking multiples yes. of these, and people know. living in solitude with... And very often in darkness for in several, darkness. several months of the year. But I think the fact that some of them went back is probably very likely, and that they survived because there were just fewer of them. I, I don't know how many went back, far as we can tell, maybe 15, 20 of them. So there would have been perhaps enough food to go around for them. But it's pretty certain that all the crew of both ships had all died by 1850, which was five years after they set out. Wow. Still an extremely long period of time. But it strikes me as it, it is, geographically speaking, as well, this perfect mystery. You've got these clues which are hidden yes. in cairns, or yeah. you have messages which are coming down through indigenous histories mm. and there's maybe enough to tantalize but not enough to give you anything dis definitive so we're working on as you as you put it um a succession of hunches i suppose that's the, the intriguing thing about you being there at this point you'd probably be able to become the historical detective yeah, uh, to it, see if you i think i think there are so many hypotheses and so many people very good scholars have written about it we'd all be there 
that's where everyone wants to be to see what happened to those men. So this when they is the story the in, ship. It's a crucial. It's crucial the day. Moment. It's the moment. It's yeah. the scene. Yeah. And perhaps we might go so far as, or be so bold as to say, this is the uh, one of the greatest mysteries in maritime history, or the history of exploration, yeah. of course. Yeah. Well, what better place to leave us suspended <laughs> than that? I think my final point, you beautifully about this in the book, and you come to towards the end of your story, and as you describe it, you say, if Erebus was indeed named after the darkest depths of hell, it must have felt as if she had come home. That's quite a quite a thought. And it's, it's a story which really strikes me as having massive range, because you go from the excitement of the unknown, this lure of something which which propels us all forward, you know, curiosity, to, you know, the tragedy of the second voyage. So there's light shades and there's dark, there's enormous landscapes, but small personal battles that people are fighting. What I feel comes through very clearly is the optimism and the positive attitude of, of people at that time doing these amazingly difficult journeys. As they left Greenland, as I say, to go up to the Northwest Passage, we know from the last letters that it's going to be fine. We'll see you in, you know, in, in the Pacific, you know, next, next summer or something mm -hmm. like that. And the same with the Antarctic voyage, that that worked out. Their optimism was rewarded with success in the Northwest Passage, I think because there was an element of sort of national pride as well involved with it, it was slightly more a sort of imperial moment, I think, then that dashed their hopes very mm. much. And it almost bookends, in a way, a long period of exploration history, because this is really the end for wooden sailing ships in, in the way they had been understood and used, because we have the great age of iron on yeah. on the cusp of coming to be. We have um, one last question I'm going to put to you. Mm. Um, if you could bring one memento back from your travels, you can reach your hand down and pick oh, up yeah. one thing is there anything you'd like to bring? I'd, I'd bring the pub sign, Pilgrims of the Ocean. <laughs> okay. I would just love to have that. And that would be just hanging in the, in the Palin office? Oh, it? yes. In my garden. On a cold day, I'd go and sit out there and carve an eight-foot woman. <laughs> Our garden's not that big for an eight-inch woman. <laughs> well, we'd know where you live if there was a, if there was a pub yeah. sign and an eight-foot woman yes. sitting in the background. Michael Palin, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, travel through time with you. Thank you. Well, that was me, Peter Moore, talking to Michael Palin deep in our Riverside time capsule the other day. His enthusiasm for the story of the Clark Ross and Franklin Polar expeditions was clearly on display. And in his book, Erebus, the story of a ship, he really does knit these contrasting stories together in an original and quite brilliant way. So it's a book that I would recommend wholeheartedly to anyone interested in the history of exploration. I'll be back with more travels in a fortnight, and our next episode is with the historian Dr Diane Atkinson, who's going to take us to see some of the very best British suffragettes as they take on the establishment in the early 20th century. It's a brilliant, tense, and also somewhat surprising story, so please do listen out for that. I'm Paul Lay, the editor of History Today, and on our website you'll find articles written by experts relating to Michael Palin's travels. You can read Philip Hatfield on the search for the Northwest Passage, or George Woodcock on the search for Franklin, or Sheila Rowbottom on the perils of sailors' diets. Links to all of these pieces can be found at historytoday.com forward slash travels. And of course, there's many more articles on every aspect of the past in our monthly publication, History Today the world's leading serious history magazine.